issues. Those patients who are able to and willing to pay help cross-subsidize those who can't. Same doctors operate on free and paying patients. Their quality outcomes compare with the best in the West. It is a stunning, elegant, breathtakingly simple model, and it really works. Today, that 11-bed eye clinic is the largest and most productive eye care facility in the world. Since they've started, they've seen over 38 million patients. They've performed over 5 million surgeries. And the vast majority of that was done for free or at ultra-subsidized costs. Harvard has been studying their work for decades now. A case study on Aravind's work is mandatory reading for every single MBA student at Harvard Business School. It baffles their minds that an organization like this can succeed in spite of the fact that it breaks all the rules of business. And the truth is that this organization doesn't succeed in spite of the fact that it breaks those rules. It succeeds because it breaks those rules. It flips the paradigm upside down. It says compassion can drive sustainability. Compassion can drive scale and productivity and efficiency and excellence. And it's proved that many times over. And now it's replicating that model across the world and helping other organizations learn from it. I want to give you a little background on Dr. Venkarasome, Dr. B. He was born in a village, the eldest of five children, struggled. He was, there were no doctors in the village, so he lost several cousins. Before the age of 10, he'd lost three or four cousins uh, due to pregnancy, uh, childbirth-related complications. So as a five-year-old, he had decided that he was going to grow up and become a doctor and prevent such untimely tragedies. So he made his way to and through medical school. And then in his early 30s, he contracted a rare and extreme form of rheumatoid arthritis. He was 31. It twisted and froze his fingers permanently out of shape. He was bedridden for two years. He was in such excruciating pain, and it's a chronic condition, so he never fully recovered. Pain was a constant companion in his life. And yet, when he had enough strength to go back to medical school, to stand, to walk, they told him that his chosen career in obstetrics was no longer a possibility. He ended up in the ophthalmology department. He trained those fingers to cut and operate the eye. He performed delicate sight-restoring surgeries, and in his time as a government surgeon, he performed over 100,000 surgeries. And this was before he'd started Aravind. So when you look at that, you know, his commitment, his dedication, there are 12 million blind people in India. Over 80% of that blindness is curable. He knew he had a gift that he could give, and so he worked tirelessly. He worked like a man possessed. And what fueled him was that deep conviction that we are here to serve each other, that in doing that, we build ourselves, we build our capacities, and that the whole world is lit up. This man has, through his legacy, lit millions of eyes. And I'd like to give you, through a small video, just to bring his voice and his actions and his spirit into the room, to give you just a glimpse of what his life held. I used to sit with the ordinary village man because I am from a village. And suddenly he turned around and then you see he seemed to contact his inner being. You seem to be one with him. But here is a soul which has got all the simplicity of confidence. Doctor, whatever you say, I accept it. An implicit faith in you. And then you respond it. Here is an old lady who has got so much faith in me. I must do my best for her. When we grow in spiritual consciousness, we are into ourselves with all that is in the world, so there is no exploitation. It is ourselves we are helping, it is ourselves we are healing. It amazes me every time when I see this to look back on the fact that Aravind was started after Dr. V's retirement. Aravind was his retirement project. That's what he did instead of going out to play golf. You know, you look at that capacity that we each have. He was an ordinary man with an extraordinary conviction, an extraordinary commitment to service. What he did will continue to live, live on. And you look at these, all of these people. You know, here was a crippled surgeon. 
you look back at a boy with polio, a food thief, a former food thief, a victim of a, of a gang attack, the way they responded to their lives, the potential that they drew on inside of them, the giftivism that they exhibited, that lies in each one of us. You look at our, whatever age, whatever circumstances, whatever you know, struggles we might have, we also have those seeds within us to manifest. Giftivism isn't something for a distant utopian future. You know, when everything else is taken care of, then we can do this. It's part of our inheritance in this very moment. The rewards are built in. When you move from consumption to contribution, you tap into the joy of purpose. When you move from transaction to trust, you build that web of resilience. When you move from isolation to community, you tap into the power of synergy. And when you replace that mindset of scarcity with one of abundance, you tap into radically new possibilities. It's truly infinite what we're capable of. Martin Luther King Jr., he once said, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't need this is what he said. He said, you don't need a college degree to serve. You don't need to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't need to know the third law of thermodynamics to serve. You just need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. Each one of us has that potential to achieve greatness through service, to practice those small acts with great love, I'd like to tell one more story, um, then share another little video, but it's the story of a dear friend of ours who I think embodies Gandhi's messages in today's world. He lives in India and works out of the Gandhi Ashram, and many volunteers from all over the world come throughout the year. And one of his um, practices when a new volunteer comes is to have them spend a few days living in the slums. He pairs them with someone from the slums and has them follow that person in their footsteps, you know, really understand who they are, where they're coming from. It changes them. You know, sometimes we have these ideas of coming and helping somebody else without really knowing who they are and without really understanding that service is really about coming from a space of humility, that it is a deep privilege, that we receive, you know, tremendously more than we give. There was a nurse who'd come from the States, and she was paired up to live with a elderly woman who was a scavenger, which meant her job was sorting through the trash and picking out scraps of cloth, plastic, paper that could then be sold. That was how she made her living day in and day out. And so this young woman was asked to live and follow in the footsteps of this elderly lady. And one of the things that this woman, older woman, had a habit, a practice of doing every morning, she would get up and she would take a little bit of, she was very poor, had very little resources, but she would take a handful of rice flour and she would walk through the village and she would feed the ants. And our volunteer from the West looked at this first day and she came to, um, you know, her mentor, Jayesh Bhai, and she said, I really don't get this whole feeding the ants business. You know, it's not necessary. Ants can find their own food. And Jayesh Bhai said, you know, why don't you just go with it? Just, just take it on as a practice. Just go with it for the three days. Just do everything that she does. And so she followed the old woman through the, the village. And the old woman would bend down and feed the ants with such love. And our volunteer would just kind of like toss some, toss some flour as she walked. Second day, she falls very ill, and she's up all night with a fever and a headache, and the old woman is by her side without sleeping a wink. The whole night, she's making herbal tea, she's making a compress, she's holding her hand, she's stroking her forehead, and the next morning, Jayeshbhai comes to check on the volunteer, and as soon as she sees him, the volunteer bursts into tears. And Jayeshbhai says, what happened? And she says, Jayeshbhai, I have never been taken care of with so much love. Not even my own mother has taken such good care of me. How, I am a stranger. I didn't know this woman three days ago. How does she have so much love for a stranger? And Jayeshbhai looks at her 
very gently, and he says, don't you see? She practices with the ants every day. She practices with the ants every day. These small acts, seemingly insignificant acts of kindness, of generosity, of compassion, they build us and they allow us to step up in those moments when we can be of service to other people. In those moments, we truly discover who we are and what our potential is. One of the things that we've discovered in the work that we do is that wherever your boundary is, you can always push it a little further. You know, we all think of ourselves, we are kind, we're generous, we do service, we are engaged in these wonderful activities, yes. And there's always that little bit more that you can do. And so we thought, you know what, let's, let's do a challenge. We started this with some of our young interns, young teenagers, who took on a 30-day kindness challenge. Every single day, a unique act of kindness for a month. And by the end of the month, transform, transformations in the family, in the schools, they've learned so much about their own capacities. And so we thought, well, why not, why do this with just a few people? Let's open it up. Let's do a kindness challenge that anyone can sign up for. So last September, starting September 11th, we did a 21-day kindness challenge. We thought we'd have a few hundred people sign up, 6,000 people from all over the world, 90 different countries committed to doing. We would send them an email every day with a unique act of kindness that they could practice. And then they would share their stories on our website. And it was phenomenal. Fourth graders who were going out and doing kind acts for their parents, grandparents who were doing it for their neighbors, neighbors who were doing it for their garbage man or their, you know, their postman. All of a sudden, all of these ripples going out in all different directions. And at the end of it, we had a, it was the closing day, and we had a friend who said, he's a musician, he was so inspired, he said, I'm going to write a song on kindness, and I'm going to dedicate it to all of these people around the world who have that, all the people who have that spark and who spread these ripples. And so he created this beautiful song, and almost, you know, in just a matter of a few days, there was a music video with it. These are beautifully talented uh, videographers, musicians, and volunteers from all over the world who created this music video. It's called Being Kind that I wanted to share.
Just grab a friend and give a hug. Spread it out real wide so everyone can be touched. Show your heart love. Let it fly high. little hearts that you see in the video, those are made by slum children and the women in the slums of Ahmedabad. And uh, they've been gifting them all over the world. They've been sending their love, you know, it's their gesture of generosity. And we have some of those heart pins and smile cards and other gifts from the community that they wanted to share uh, with, with all of you. And so it's